So we can start, I guess, as soon as maybe, maybe in a minute. Okay. Okay. I don't want to hear the bell, so <laughs> let's wait a bit. Okay, then uh, we can get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today we're gonna have another lecture in seminar, uh, in seminar in computer architecture course. And today we're going to mainly be covering to the topics related to the genome analysis. So before I guess uh, I move into the slides, I'll, I want to introduce myself. Uh, I'm John. I am a PhD student in the software research group uh, led by Professor Nurmutlu, as you may know. And my research interests are mainly related to the uh, uh, topics about bioinformatics and computer architecture. More specifically, I'm interested in, in, in analyzing the genomes in real time, uh, doing some similar to search in a very accurate and fast way, designing, co-designing uh, hardware and algorithm together for fast and accurate genome analysis and genome editing and error correction type of problems related to, again, genome analysis. So you can, of course, get to know us and, and our research uh, using our website. I also have my personal academic website over here. Uh, you can also contact me using my Gmail address, or uh, you can follow my tweets, academic tweets on Twitter, or I guess currently known as X. Uh, so agenda for today is we're going to be briefly having uh, an introduction to genomics. Uh, mainly, I'm going to be showing you the, the, the ways that we're taking nowadays to analyze the genomes, and I'm going to be describing you what an intelligent genome analysis can be. And then we're going to be going over uh, the step-by-step -step genome analysis and algorithm hardware acceleration steps and also the future opportunities. So I guess then let's take an even step uh, uh, Further back, let's say, and let's think about the, the goal, of, goal of computing, essentially. So why uh, we are doing computing, right? So essentially what we're doing, right, we're generating numbers. And I guess uh, nowadays there are many reasons to do computation. Uh, it can be actually even be about the entertainment purposes, right? But when we think about, let's say, the scientific purposes, one of the main goals of doing computing is actually to generate insights. From, from numbers. So our goal is not really to generate numbers, but we want to be able to answer uh, uh, the open problems by generating uh, insights. And um, essentially today, this is much more important because we're generating lots of lots of data uh, with, the, with the specialized hardwares that, that, uh, that's being improved. Uh, day by day. So this is today, this is even much more important to generate, quickly generate insights from the data that we're generating. And the big data is basically everywhere uh, in, in many basically important applications. So when you essentially take a look at the, the astronomy or the social media the data that we're generating from Twitter, uh, YouTube, or even genomics, right? So we're generating really uh, lots of data per year. So the question is, can we really catch up uh, with the processing technology that that also has been uh, improving over the over the years, right? So this is an example of of uh, perhaps the the Intel's recent development. So they are actually even pushing further down to the angstrom uh, uh, levels. So we are even like talking now talking about the beyond of the nanometer scale. So essentially, the technology is clearly trying to uh, 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 keep pace with, the, with the, uh, the speed that we're generating the data, but essentially this is still a problem, right? So today uh, we have a huge problem with, with, the, with the data analysis because right now the speed that we're generating the data is actually improving faster than the speed that we're improving these uh, processing technologies. And here essentially what you can see over there, we have this particular special purpose machine that generates a data with 
with a, let's say a huge speed and this is extremely fast and essentially the goal here so this type of uh, basic machine can have particular goals for example uh, we, we may need to analyze all the data that we're generating in a very let's say a short period of time to answer some critical questions but the problem is that we're basically using general purpose machines to do that and as you can see this machine is extremely scared uh, to, to do this computation. So it, it can even tell you that, I mean, maybe I cannot analyze this data, but maybe I can, uh, 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 I can let you play some games even run crisis for you. But essentially this is slow to analyze this uh, particular type of data. And the main problem is that uh, there are lots of data movement uh, that, that, that's happening uh, over, over in the uh, general purpose machine. So, but we're, basically really interested in uh, analyzing this type of data for mainly for scientific purposes. So essentially the reason is that type of data usually contains extremely valuable information. So we may extract really valuable uh, knowledge from that particular data. And of course, uh, this type of data may also have certain goals. Let's say we may need to analyze this data with a high speed, let's say maybe with a even very short latency, uh, also, even the energy can be another constraint, or you may think of other costs, like maybe even a monetary cost, et cetera. And uh, essentially, what we really want to do is that we want to enable intelligent data analysis for, let's say, that are essentially tailored for uh, many important applications, such as AI, ML, uh, genomics, medicine, or health. So I guess you may remember this slide from maybe the, from the first lecture. So if you remember, we have four key directions uh, in our group, and this is one of the directions that we're taking. We're trying, we're designing essentially the hardware and software together to accelerate uh, 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 these important applications. So then I guess let's now uh, start focusing on, on, on the genome analysis uh, 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 direction. So. Today, it's really important, essential to achieve faster, scalable, and accurate genome analysis for many reasons, basically. B because such a genome analysis can enable us to understand the genetic variations, species, evolution, faster and, and, and more accurate, and which may actually even contain extremely valuable information to uh, improve the quality of life, let's say. So this can also enable us to predict the, the presence of the, of the relative abundance of the species around us. By doing so, we can perhaps take quick actions. Uh, for example, if there is a particular virus that can be extremely dangerous for our human health, we can actually extremely quickly do some, take some, uh, make some measurements uh, for rapid surveillance of uh, disease outbreaks, let's say. And this is also very important for developing personalized medicines, meaning if, if you understand uh, each individual, individual's genome extremely fast and accurately, we could actually offer uh, medicine for, for everyone, tailored for everyone uh, to basically uh, uh, maximize the uh, benefit of these uh, treatments. So then I guess let's uh, try to answer uh, the question, what is a genome, right? So I guess uh, assuming, I guess like since you can see all of these, let's say, or you can follow what I'm saying, or maybe even thinking what is a genome, uh, it, it tells me that everyone here should actually have a genome, right? This is basically the essential for every living organism, otherwise, it's, it's essentially not possible to build complex life structures. But I guess let's uh, define this uh, loosely. So what a genome can be is essentially uh, the entire set of DNA sequences in a particular cell. And this is, what this means is that this is basically a, a set of uh, ATGCs. Uh, the, basically a DNA is an alphabet of four letters, uh, uh, as I said, A, T, A, T, and G, and C. So I'm going to be describing more, uh, more this. But I guess then uh, the another question could be, then how large is a human genome, right? So it contains a, a, a series of characters of four letters, but how large is it really, right? So this is, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this building. Uh, Maybe, can you guess where this is or what is this? It's actually, there are, there are, I guess, two very similar buildings in Zurich, 
So I already gave you one hint. Yeah. That's true. The, yeah. Do you know the name of the building? Exactly. Yeah. That's Andrea's term. And uh, we actually have offices in, in, in uh, some of the floors here. So maybe if you look closely, you'll see one of us over there. Probably unlikely. But yes, this is Andrea's term in Zurich, in Orlikon. So to put your perspective, if you basically sequenced a human genome and write every letter uh, in a piece of paper until the end of your genome, and then basically collect all these papers and then build a pile of papers, the size of the genome, essentially, it will be much taller than the Andreas term. And I did the math over there, if you are curious. So if you did this, this would be around 100 meter long, whereas the Andreas term is around uh, 75 meters long. Uh, essentially, this is telling us that uh, even uh, a sequencing data from a single uh, 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 human genome is extremely large in terms of the data uh, size. So, so then you can imagine how hard perhaps could it be to construct, reconstruct the full human reference genome, even back in the earlier days, where, where, like when we didn't have any, let's say, high throughput, really fast uh, sequencing machines that can give us this uh, human genome sequencing data at a very high speed. So uh, we first, essentially, uh, the scientists were uh, first finished this uh, first human genome uh, in 2003. So this took around 13 years for them to uh, complete the first version of the human reference genome. And actually it costed around $3 billion. And literally, so all, although this wasn't like writing a single base uh, for basically every character in, the, in, in your genome to a letter, it was actually close to that. So people were looking at, at a very, let's say, uh, uh, close distance and then trying to note down basically every particular base in the human genome, almost base by base. And then this was done basically by many hundreds of scientists. And by doing so, this was actually an accurate way, which is actually still being done nowadays, but it's extremely costly. That's why it took a lot of money and time. <clears throat> but even then it wasn't complete. Uh, but as the sequencing technologies improved, uh, two years ago, uh, uh, we finally completed the uh, uh, human reference genome in a, let's say, complete and gapless way. So we currently have the complete version of the human reference genome. And since basically such a completion has a huge impact, the people behind it uh, actually were recognized as the uh, top 100 most influential uh, people uh, in 2022 by the Times Magazine. So actually uh, one of the people here are, are one, is our uh, past collaborator. Uh, but I guess we're not focusing on uh, the human genome uh, 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 a lot. Maybe let's put also another perspective and then think about the other species. Uh, so this is basically uh, an, an example as a viral genome and its size is around uh, 5,000 uh, bases. And this is, again, as I said, a viral genome. And so if we move a little bit further, this is a bacteria called E. coli, which is actually extremely dangerous. Uh, it can be contaminated in food and can be extremely dangerous for, for human. But the uh, point is that the virus, this particular virus can inf uh, infect this particular bacteria. And the size of this bacteria is around 5.5 uh, million. And now we have human, uh, which is around 3.2 uh, uh, billion bases. So I guess now maybe we can see a particular trend here as the genome size increases, maybe the complexity, let's say, uh, is also improving. But I guess hopefully that's not the case because we have onion here whose uh, genome size is around 16 billion bases. So is onion more complex than a human being? Well, I guess it depends on the criteria of, of your complexity, right? But in terms of the intelligence, hopefully no. Uh, and we can actually even uh, go further. And then th these are essentially plant genomes. And this particular plant genome has around uh, 150 billion bases, which is uh, 50 times longer than a human genome. But I guess you can see it, we're not even limited by the uh, data size that is uh, defining, let's say, the human genome. But if you are interested in analyzing the plant genomes, the problem is even bigger. Uh, so. 
human chromosome includes uh, 23 pairs of uh, chromosomes, 22, 22 of them are autosomes, basically not uh, sex chromosomes, and uh, uh, basically one of them is, is, a, is a sex chromosome here. So one pair of the chromosomes are coming from uh, one of your parents, and the other one is coming from the other parent, essentially. So when you look closely, you're going to see this famous structure of the double helix structure of the DNA, and we have this nucleic bases over there, which are basically adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And the rule is basically based on, defined by the chemical bonds between these structures. When you see an adenine in one of the strands, basically this is one of the strands here, next to it, it should be that we should be seeing a, a, a thymine. So this is basically the structure that we have. It's basically finding that, uh, that like how the uh, cells are behaving. So if you, if you look, uh, under uh, electron microscope, this is literally how the chromosomes uh, uh, look. So now I guess let's uh, also briefly describe the central dogma of molecular biology. I guess like how, let's say everything is loosely working in the in the cell level and how uh, basically they are functioning. So I like to do this analogy. Uh, since I guess we are all computer scientists, maybe it's going to be uh, a lot more easier for us to understand. So DNA is essentially this sequences of ATGCs, right? So, but it's almost doing nothing more than that. It's defining the the, the recipe. It's defining the, the the ingredients, let's say, of of what needs to be done. And this is extremely actually similar to let's say the source code that you may be writing for your program. Source code may have let's say uh, the comments like macros and like where some parts in the source code can be essentially disabled, the comments are doing anything, uh, et cetera, right? So the DNA essentially is, gets transcribed to RNA. So RNA is basically a sort of uh, 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 generated from the useful parts of the DNA. And this is actually very similar to, to, the, to the assembly or the binary that you would generate from a source code, right? So you're not really generating your assembly or binary from every part of your source code. So for example, the comments are not really transcribed to the, to, the, to the binary or like the disabled macros are also not uh, transferred, right? So it's essentially also the binary is using the useful part of the source code. And then what happens is that next, this RNA is uh, generated, is basically translated into the amino acids, which, which is then building uh, the protein itself, which is essentially the functioning part uh, of, of our cells and of our, let's say, body. And this is also similar to how the binary would be executed uh, on a processor. So genome itself is very important because uh, if you understand it closely and if you understand basically the differences between a healthy cell and let's say a cell with a particular disease, we can actually pinpoint what's causing uh, uh, that particular disease. And this, in this example, let's say we collect the genomic data from many individuals and then we look closely and what we perhaps observe is that uh, maybe when you start seeing a C instead of T at this location, there is a high chance that you're going to end up having a high blood uh, pressure. And how this is done is basically you collect a group of people, let's say a thousand people that are, let's say not showing that particular symptom that you're looking for and another uh, control group with that particular symptom, you sequence, you generate their sequencing data uh, for all of them. And then you essentially look at uh, whether there is a significant uh, correlation between uh, particular SNPs. So these SNPs are basically uh, single changes or a single nucleotide polymorphism. So th these single mutations, whether they appear in a particular control group uh, that, uh, that are showing uh, uh, the particular symptom. And if we can find a, such a correlation, we can perhaps say that, okay, maybe that particular location at a particular uh, 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 chromosome may be correlated with uh, a certain, uh, let's say, um, uh, symptom or disease. And if you're interested, you can, of course, read this paper. And there are actually literally databases. So if you assume that if you could sequence your genome and then uh, see basically your basis at every position, what you could do, you could actually go to this particular website and then search. If you have a mutation at a position, you can search whether that mutation is causing anything or not. So you can see perhaps uh, maybe this is likely uh, causing hepatitis C or not, et cetera. I guess this is at least much better than 
searching in Google and figuring out perhaps, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, I guess dangerous things which are probably not true. Um, and of course, we have much larger variations in the genome. This is not happening in a single base uh, level. This may be happening, basically, you may, we may have huge deletions in your genome or huge insertions or basically translations and so on. And then this may lead to also uh, many diseases such as autism, schizophrenia, obesity, or uh, underweight, or many other basic diseases. And this is all basically described in this paper if you're interested. So I guess like understanding perhaps why genome analysis or how genome analysis can be important. So next question is, does intelligent genome analysis really matter? So we touched on the intelligent genome analysis a little bit in the beginning of the uh, lecture, but let's define it a little bit more uh, uh, in a more concrete level. So what we really want from uh, intelligent genome analysis is we want to achieve, let's say, fast analysis, right? So this may mean that we want to achieve uh, low latency or a high throughput for real-time analysis purposes. We want to do our analysis in a large scale. So this means that if our analysis mechanism, if, if it is basically applicable to a single uh, person, it should also be applicable to, let's say, thousands of people uh, at, at a time. Uh, of course, we want, to do, we want to perform accurate analysis, meaning we really want, don't want to diagnose someone incorrectly, right? This is extremely uh, uh, sensitive analysis, basically. And by doing so, what we really want to do is that we want to use intelligent architectures. We want to use the architecture that fits our purpose. Uh, and the last point is that DNA is extremely a valuable asset to protect. So this means that the privacy is very important for that particular sensitive data. So we're basically talking about all of these uh, in this paper. Uh, so you can go and read this, but I'll quickly go over these steps uh, one by one uh, very quickly. So for example, a fast genome analysis, an example for fast genome analysis, what it could mean is that maybe we want to perform the analysis in mere seconds, let's say, using limited computational resources, for example, using your personal computer or maybe even using your mobile device, right, if it is even possible. And uh, one example for such a, a fast uh, uh, analysis is uh, basically uh, this uh, UK is currently offering this personalized medicine for critically ill uh, infants. Uh, they are performing rapid whole genome sequencing uh, analysis. So whole genome sequencing means we're sequencing your entire genome. And rapid literally means that we want to do it fast so that we can generate uh, the results pretty quickly. And there are basically certain goals, right? So it needs to be done in two days or five days so that we can uh, provide answers quickly. And this is actually a requirement now uh, in the UK for every seriously ill children, uh, the whole genome sequencing is now basically a part of their uh, healthcare. Uh, the another point is that the rapid surveillance of disease outbreaks. So I guess we all remember the, 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 the COVID outbreak, but the, the sequencing, uh, the, the genome sequencing and the genome analysis also has been helping to, to basically understand the outbreaks uh, better. For example, a particular uh, a sequencer over there is a very small one, a nanopore sequencer has been used to uh, basically identify the uh, uh, Zika spread uh, in, in Africa. This also has been used for uh, for uh, 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 identifying the contaminated samples, uh, uh, samples contaminated with the COVID virus and also for uh, Ebola virus. So people are now using basically the DNA sequencing or genome sequencing to, for rapid surveillance of uh, disease outbreaks. And uh, if you like, you may also think there was also such a thing that's called PCR testing, right? So we, uh, the PCR testing actually has been used for mainly for testing purposes during the COVID-19 outbreak. And this was extremely useful because it, it's, it was providing us reliable results for known uh, regions to target, right? But the question is, do we know the region basically to target at the beginning of the, 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 the outbreak? So the answer is no, because it needs to be sequenced. The genome needs to be sequenced. It needs to be understood. So this means that it's really hard to customize the PCR, so you really need to understand the genome, but there's also the high latency to get the answer. So it, there is usually a few hours in between your test and the answer that you're getting. And people are now using basically uh, uh, genomes, DNA sequencing for uh, COVID-19 uh, testing and probably 
probably in the future for other uh, purposes. So I guess the other point is large scale uh, analysis. Maybe one example is population scale microbiome profiling. So the goal could be uh, what organisms are present in a given environment and how abundant they are. Right? So the population scale genomics can also try to answer a uh, given a population uh, how can we understand basically the, the 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 profile of that particular population? Right? Do they basically uh, prone to particular disease or not? And so this is one example uh, that was done uh, among 50,000 50, uh, Icelanders, let's say. And such an analysis using this particular tool took around 83 CPRs per per individual. So if you have a really powerful sample uh, server, let's say with 64, let's say, CPUs, this means that this is one hour per individual. We have 50,000 individuals, so you can do the math of, of the cost, basically. So it needs to be really scalable to, to many, uh, many individuals in an accurate and, and fast way. And we've also been doing uh, uh, city-scale microbiome profiling. What this means is that you, we may be collecting, let's say, samples from the random locations of the city. And the, basically the question that we're trying to answer, whether basically there is a, a let's say, outbreak going on uh, or starting in the genome itself, in the, in the city itself. So by doing so, we also want to do accurate analysis so this is basically one example of, of how important uh, how important it is to do an accurate analysis. Uh, so um, that was basically a question of whether there's a plague in the New York uh, uh, subway system a few years ago. A plague is probably, you know, it's basically, uh, it was an epidemic in the 14th century in the Europe, I guess, uh, wiped out almost uh, one third of the population. Uh, so this is essentially also known as the Black Death, right? So you can imagine the, 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 how people could be scared. And basically, people were extremely worried whether there was a plague because the, the, the genome analysis, the microbiome analysis that people were doing at the time were showing this. But essentially, this turned out to be uh, uh, essentially a false analysis. And then this was regarded as the failure of, of bioinformatics. But this is not essentially, not necessarily a failure of, of some field, right? Because uh, the technology has been improving, the tools has been improving, and clearly back, the, back at the time, the, the analysis uh, or the tools that we're using for that particular analysis wasn't ready to do such an analysis. And actually the error was, apparently there was another organism that's, that's, that is sharing, uh, let's say, uh, 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 a region in, in its DNA with the with the basically the, the plague, and because of that, although there was this particular organism that was in plague itself, people thought that since that the region of the genome has been shared by plague, people thought that actually this was actually coming from a plague genome, and uh, 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 that's why essentially people were scared. So, but nowadays uh, these tools are improving. Even there are uh, uh, benchmarking suites. People are submitting their tools, uh, and uh, uh, a basic other group of people are analyzing these tools using, uh, let's say, a black box data set, and then ranking these tools based on their accuracy and and, and how uh, fast they are. Uh, and basically, this type of benchmarking has been done almost every uh, two years, if I remember correctly. Uh, so basically, clearly, the tools are improving, and this is one of the tools that does such an analysis. So the, I guess the, one of the last points is that uh, using also intelligent architectures and also the reliability is also extremely important. So I put this picture, which is not really related to the genome analysis, but I, I think it puts a really good perspective. So when you're on a plane, you really don't want the plane to have a failure, right? You, it's, it, you really, you're really relying on this. And this is also very similar in genome analysis. You're really relying on the, on the device that, that we're performing the analysis. And this is also extremely even more sensitive because we're doing the genome analysis even in extremely extreme, let's say, environment, even, for example, in outer space and even in Mars. Uh, so this is a paper that was that came like a, a month ago. Extremely interesting. So if you're interested in this uh, particular field, I would strongly suggest you to like a look to take a look at it. And what an intelligent architecture may mean that we don't really have to basically use general purpose computing, but the goal is to fit to to find the best, let's say, architecture 
and the algorithm so that we can achieve our goal. For example, we may want to use a mobile device, let's say, for genome analysis. So the last point here is uh, DNA is extremely valuable asset to protect. And maybe if you, you've probably heard of it, uh, I'm not sure, but this was a recent uh, data leakage. Uh, people, more and more people have been using 23andMe nowadays. And apparently uh, uh, there was a particular data leakage from, from uh, 23andMe. So this basically caused a concern because apparently those hackers right now are targeting people with Jewish uh, ancestry. So you can see basically how sensitive such an important uh, sensitive uh, data this is and how important this is to protect. And of course, people are taking measures to protect this such a sensitive uh, uh, data. And there are even companies now promising that uh, we'll do your, we'll, we will do your genome analysis by also protecting your privacy. So I guess, Coming back to this slide, hopefully it's now clear, uh, even more clear, like how important it is to do faster scale and accurate genome analysis. And the applications are really limited by our imagination. For example, now people are doing genome editing, meaning we're pinpointing the particular positions in your genome and we're literally changing a particular base in your genome. For example, we may be turning off the functionality of the gene or turning even on by inserting the, the bases that we want to insert. And so this means that maybe we'll be able to even wipe out really, uh, 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 let's say dangerous uh, diseases uh, in the future. And since this has a basically a huge potential going into the future, uh, these people, uh, Jennifer Doudna and uh, Emmanuel Charpentier, uh, they basically won the Nobel Prize two years ago, three years ago, by the paper that they published in 2012 or 2011. So in eight years, they, from, from, the, from that particular work, they got the Nobel Prize. So it's sort of telling you how important and promising this field is. And basically the other application could be DNA computing. People are now literally using DNAs to do computation. For example, this is an example for traveling salesman problem. And what people are doing essentially, they are encoding, let's say the cities that have a connection in between with a DNA in a way that the cities will connect to each other based on the, based on the chemical bonds that we know that, that, that they exist and also based on the graph structure, let's say. And then they are letting the uh, biology do its work, meaning uh, there will be a connection uh, only if basic or DNAs will bond only if basically there is a connection in the graph. And this is extremely important because you have massive parallelism over here, meaning you may have like millions of millions of agents that say working in parallel. This means that maybe they can answer to question like the really hard questions such as a uh, training salesman problem in a very uh, short amount of time. There are also other applications such as, for, for example, you can even uh, use your DNA to do shopping. Um, I guess then the real question is basically to know how and where to enable fast, accurate, cheap, privacy preserving and exabyte scale analysis of genomic data to achieve intelligent genome analysis. And this has been our dream basically, I guess over almost two decades. So what we really want to achieve is that we want to build an embedded device, let's say that can perform comprehensive genome analysis in real time even within a minute, maybe within seconds, by basically uh, uh, answering important questions. And to achieve this, we should really think of the entire uh, 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 stack of computer architecture, almost starting from the problem down to the electrons, right? Even further, like we're now using DNA to do the computation. Uh, so if you're interested in basically how we're uh, doing, how we're accelerating genome analysis uh, with algorithm architecture co-design, you can also take a look at this Paper is basically summarizing the recent works in the field. But essentially there's a bright future for intelligent genome analysis uh, because the sequencing technology has been improving, the tools are improving and the technology, the processing technology itself is improving. So this brings me to the second part of, 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 the, of, the, of, my, of the lecture. And so I guess uh, now perhaps I can uh, uh, show you step-by-step step how genome analysis in real time uh, is done. Uh, thanks, Mohamed. Uh, so it basically starts with a sample collection. So this could mean um, maybe a blood sample, or you may simply swap like something over here and then collect it. And what you do is that you prepare your 
library, meaning you put into uh, some wet solution, you purify it, you amplify it, and so on, so that your DNA is now, let's say, prepared in a nice way. And basically, the DNAs are also fragmented into smaller parts, and the sequencing device is taking this DNA and it's generating uh, a data, let's say, at a very high speed. And that data is not basically directly ATGCs. It's basically some raw data. And it can be, let's say, electrical signals that is corresponding to, to the basis in your DNA. That could be set of images, again, corresponding to the basis. It's basically up to us how, uh, how to interpret, interpret that raw data so that we can do our analysis uh, for, for the genome. And there are basically lots of tools, lots of steps in the genome analysis, starting from the translating from the raw data that the sequencing machine is generating down to basically understanding what sort of variations you have. And this is basically more or less how the genome analysis pipeline looks. It starts from data generation down to basically figuring out what sort of mutations you have compared to some, let's say, uh, 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 reference genome. So. Um, I'll uh, focus on uh, uh, the first step quickly, which is basically obtaining the sequencing data. Uh, so I guess maybe one important question is also to understand uh, maybe the scale of the problem. Uh, basically, the question is, comp uh, can we generate the complete genome in one piece, right? Uh, assume you have, a, let's say, a full chromosome, right? Uh, at least this is the the the... Uh, perhaps the the larger scale that we can go, right? Uh, so, given that particular chromosome can be generated, so given the given this as an input to the machine, can be generated also the data in one piece, uh, basically a full chromosome. So the answer uh, is unfortunately no. Uh, no machine can give you this complete sequence of genome as output. But the goal of DNA sequencing is basically. Uh, find the complete sequence of these ATGCs in an organism's DNA. And the challenge is that there is no machine, as I said, that takes the long DNA as input and gives the complete sequence as output. Rather, we have this random chunks of DNA where we don't know where they belong to in your genome, so that the other challenge is to figure out where they belong to in the genome. Uh, so basically, DNA sequencer is a chopper. So this is your, let's say, your, your genome. This is chopped into small pieces. And what we eventually uh, end up getting is these fragments of your uh, uh, DNA that we call reads. And they also don't contain uh, their order information, meaning, so when I look at it, I don't really know basically where this was uh, coming from in the genome. So the goal is basically given this uh, 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 reads, the goal is to figure out basically uh, 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 where it belongs to so that we can understand the genome and then do analysis. Uh, and basically there are many sequencing machines that uh, gives that performs that task. For example, we have uh, Illumina machines that are extremely fast uh, and also accurate, but the problem with them is they will give us very short fragments of, of the DNA. We also have like uh, other type of uh, sequencing technology known as the Oxford nanopore sequencers, uh, they will, uh, they are also fast, uh, but they are, let's say, less accurate than the Illumina machines. Basically, there are trade-offs between these sequencing technologies. But I guess the important thing to know here is that there are newer uh, genome sequencing technologies that's getting, uh, let's say, improved uh, over the years. And there are many opportunities uh, with these technologies. So as I said, these technologies are generating uh, different row of sequencing data Right, and they have different types of trade-offs. For example, a particular uh, uh, sequencing machine may be extremely accurate, but they may be generating really short fragments. And in a minute, I'll basically try to tell you why uh, we don't prefer to have short reads. And some other technologies may have, let's say, uh, uh, extremely long, but slightly uh, inaccurate uh, reads and so on. So I'll quickly describe you like how one of these sequencing technologies work, uh, in particular, nanopore sequencing. So nanopore sequencing is essentially uh, is a widely used sequencing technology in the field. So it can generate long DNA fragments or reads up to 2 million bases. 
So remember, a human genome is around 3.2 billion bases. And this also offers portable sequencing. So some sequences are really huge. It can be almost like the size of like this small part of the room. Uh, but some of these are extremely uh, uh, small that they can fit your hand, let's say. Uh, they are relatively cost effective and they are actually providing some unique features such as real time analysis. So um, nanopore sequencing idea actually has been around for almost a five decade. And the idea is, so when you essentially uh, think about it, the idea is perhaps relatively extremely simple. So you should like imagine a, a three layer uh, 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 solution here, or, or basically a, a dimension or basically an area with three layers. So we have top layer, uh, which is negatively charged, the middle layer we call membrane, and also the bottom layer with positively charged uh, uh, site. And we know that th these are negatively and positively charged because we apply the voltage in that particular way. So what happens is that since the DNA itself is mainly negatively charged, there's an electromagnetic field basically going on uh, over there. So what happens is that DNA literally moves towards the negatively charged area towards the positively charged area. And this basically, while it, 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 it moves, it actually goes through uh, a, 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 a tiny pore that we call nanopore. And as it, as it moves, the, the, the ionic current measurements basically are uh, reported. So these measurements can tell us, they are significant enough to tell us, to tell the individual uh, basis in your genome. So we're literally generating uh, electrical signals as the DNA moves through that particular pore. And these electrical signals are telling us the basis because they are significant enough for us to identify each uh, base in the DNA. So then what happens is that as we generate electrical signal, what we can do is we can uh, do some, perform some computational analysis to convert these electrical signals to the base called uh, reads, which are basically ATGCs. But the other advantage is that we can also analyze this data in real time while this electrical signal is generated and take actions accordingly, meaning we can tell the sequencer to stop sequencing that particular read, for example, if you are interested, if you are not interested in that read anymore. So this is a unique feature that nanopore sequencing is providing. And how this work is basically when we want to, when we don't want to sequence that particular DNA anymore, we apply the voltage in the other way, such that the, such that the, now the top side is positively charged and the bottom side is negatively charged. So the DNA now starts moving upwards so that we can stop sequencing. So uh, we essentially uh, 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 utilize this uh, uh, feature of nanopore sequencing in one of our works. So if you're interested in, in this field, you can, you can read this paper. We also have been, let's say, producing uh, more works in this area. So this is a uh, more optimized version of the previous work. This is also another work that makes this analysis even more accurate. And uh, this is basically uh, is essentially uh, doing the analysis after base calling to perform the genome analysis even faster. But essentially this is a very exciting time uh, to be doing such a genome analysis because such a genome analysis is now, let's say relatively cheap. So you may order, let's say a, a, a particular device that may be capable of uh, sequencing your entire genome even twice or three times uh, and generate the data and you can plug this to your personal computer and analyze your genome. So you can think of the opportunities for portable sequencing now. So you can bring your, let's say, portable sequencer somewhere. Maybe you're interested in whether like there's something dangerous here. You can, assuming that you can prepare your library nicely, uh, you can understand your, uh, we can now understand our environment even much in a cheaper and faster way. And uh, these basically uh, sequencing data is not only generate, uh, co containing the ATGC information. I know I'm not going to give you basically further information, but the, uh, the DNA contains more information than just ATGCs. So it's also uh, enabling us to understand the other, other chemical structures that may be important 
for understanding the human genome, let's say. But they, they have one common disadvantage, which is basically, regardless of the sequencing machine, uh, the data that we're generating, they lack the information of their order and the location in the genome. And they, basically the goal is to, con to construct the, uh, the genome uh, from many reads. So this is like solving the puzzle, right? So we have, let's say we have these small pieces, which are reads that are generated from a sequencing machine, and we want to basically solve this puzzle. And the good thing is that we may have a hint, basically we may have a picture to look at that we call a reference genome, right? So remember I mentioned the human reference genome that was completed in uh, two years ago. So we can use such a reference genome to look at so that we can figure out where these reads belong to. And the trade-off between these sequencing machines is basically assume uh, in your puzzle, you have extremely small pieces. Right, so then this means that it's harder to basically solve this puzzle because it may be harder to distinguish whether that particular piece is coming from here or here. Maybe they are extremely uh, similar or even let's say identical. Right, so having longer pieces or longer reads help us basically to solve this puzzle more easily. But of course, there's no free lunch. These technologies are also usually uh, have high error rate, so that this is the ma mainly the trade-off uh, between them. Uh, maybe this is also a good time to take an extremely short break. Let's say, let's take a five minute break and then we're gonna continue uh, from here. <clears throat>
Hello. Okay. Um, all right, then uh, let's get started, uh, I guess. So five minutes ago, we were here. Hopefully everyone uh, remember. Uh, so we're basically, we're talking about the trade-offs between having large and small pieces and basically the error rates that they are proposing. And this is basically the plot that I also showed earlier. So this is basically the sort of the trade-offs we have right now with the sequencing technologies. So then let's take a look at the, 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 the second step, second main step in genome uh, analysis, which is the read mapping part. So I guess the goal of read mapping to put in, let's say, uh, a nice uh, uh, sentences is we try to solve, let's say, the life's puzzle from the sequencing output. Uh, so what we really want to do is that we want to uh, map many short DNA fragments that we call reads, let's say, that we don't know where they belong to. Yeah, you know. Right, OK. Uh, uh, in the reference genome to some basically, by also allowing some differences. We, we want to allow differences because of, because that individual may have, let's say mutations compared to the reference genome, right? Or we may have sequencing errors. We want to tolerate these errors also, right? So this is basically how digitally or logically the DNA could look like, and this is how physically it looks like. But essentially we have reads and we have a reference genome, and essentially the goal is to figure out uh, where they belong to so that we can understand, let's say, the differences and, and also the similarities between the reference genome and, and let's say, your genome, right? And the mapping short D's to a reference genome is extremely challenging because uh, we have essentially billions or millions of uh, uh, reads that are let's say 50 to a few hundred days long or even longer. So this is basically what happens when you have a reference genome. So what happened, So what, what about like when you don't have a reference genome? So in that case, assume this is your genome, which is non, in a non-human readable manner and you sequence it, you generate your reads. And then what we try to do is that we try to find the overlaps between the reads, right? So overlaps may happen in the in the particular strand or by taking the reverse complements of the reads, but essentially what we end up getting is, let's say some overlaps. And what we do, like we do some cleanup, meaning maybe some overlaps are not containing useful information. And then we figure out the connection between these overlaps so that eventually we can generate uh, your genome again from scratch. But again, th uh, this is extremely costly uh, a step to do so. Uh, so I'll show you the naive approach to do so, right? So imagine this is your read and this is your reference genome. And what you could be doing is starting from the very beginning of the reference genome, uh, you could be looking at every characters of the reference genome up until the end of the read. And then you may be doing this for the entire uh, reference genome, right? So this is basically uh, extremely costly, uh, uh, basically, uh, or even like a quadratic uh, time over there, uh, this is basically the complexity of the naive approach. So then I guess the question is how can we do this faster? Uh, I guess maybe this is also a good time to mention uh, maybe the file types that we contain, that we use to uh, store uh, these reads. We mainly have two types of files. One is a FASTA file, which only includes basically sequence, sequences of your DNA and some ID basically, to label that uh, read uh, with some information. Or we can have FASTQ files, which may contain, in addition to the sequences, which may contain some quality scores, let's say, that can tell us how uh, confident we, we, we are to tell that that particular base in the read is accurate or not. But basically, the idea is that uh, we don't really want to basically be uh, uh, processing all the bases in, in the read, but rather we want to extract some small pieces in the read and quickly tell whether basically uh, that particular, the basically small regions that we extract from the, from the read also uh, is contained in the reference genome that we're, that we're looking at. So I guess then this is done in three steps. Uh, the first step is usually, uh, uh, it usually starts with a, with, with a process called indexing. Here, what we do is that uh, uh, we put the reference genome into a nice structure so that we can quickly learn whether basically the read 
the, the basically the extracted information, the information that they extract from read is also contained in the reference genome as well. So for that, again, as I said, we built some data structure. Uh, so I'm not sure if you have any guesses. I guess it's a hard guess, but uh, let's see if you can suggest a data structure over here to achieve. So our, idea, our goal is basically uh, to build a data structure such that it contains the sequences from reference genome, and we want to query that data structure with the sequences that we extract from read to answer the question whether that extracted sequence also exists in the reference genome or not extremely quickly. Any guesses, let's say? All right, that's a, that's a hard guess, actually. So we use uh, main news uh, hash tables for that. Uh, the keys for the hash tables would be basically the sequences that we extract from reference genome, and the values that these keys will, uh, that return would be the positions uh, uh, to basically tell us that this uh, uh, particular sequence is extracted from the reference genome. Uh, so these uh, sequences that we extract are known as seeds or basically k-mers. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Exactly. That's an excellent question. The, uh, yes. So the question is, wouldn't this approach work only when, let's say, uh, the reference genome and the, the genome that we're perhaps analyzing are exactly matching, right? So this is perhaps the question or the sequence that we're extracting. Right, so this is true. So that's why uh, we're extracting, let's say, subsequences of that particular reference genome. And the length of these subsequences are extremely important for that particular reason that you just said. So we, if we basically extract really long subsequences from the reference genome and then uh, generate their location list accordingly, then the chance that we're going to see that long exact match in some, some other genome decreases, right? So that's why uh, we also adjust the length accordingly. We still rely on exact matches, let's say, for most of these works, but this also doesn't mean that if you find that, for example, a single exact match between, from a read in the reference genome, then maybe this may tell us that, okay, maybe we can start from here, and starting from here, maybe we can allow uh, some mismatches by doing some more costly operations. So what it does basically is filters out the locations for us to, to do the more costly uh, operations. Do you have other questions or was it clear? Oh, okay, great. Uh, so these seeds are also known as k-mers or q-grams or n-grams, I guess, depending on what sort of data analysis that you, course that you took, uh, but th these k-mers are basically the subsequences of, of, of from the reference genome or from any sequence that you extract. And the, le the, 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 the k is basically determining the length of the subsequence. And the question is, of course, which seeds or k-mers to store, right? Because it significantly affects the accuracy or sensitivity and the, the space requirements of the hash tables. And one idea is to extract and store all k-mers. What this, what this means is that assume that this is your reference genome, and let's say you have a k of size, in this case, seven, you may start from the very beginning and shift right. This is another k-mer, another k-mer, another k-mer, and so on, right? So this means that you may generate all seven mers uh, by shifting uh, by one character every time, and then you may just uh, generate some hash values from those to use them as uh, values, uh, keys, and then store them in a hash table along with their positions. Uh, benefit is that this is highly sensitive because there is no information lost, but this also in, in, uh, incurs large storage space requirements for us. So there are other techniques. Uh, for example, this is a technique known as minimizers. Instead of basically uh, extracting and storing all the minimizers, uh, all the k-mers, what we do is that we again uh, extract, let's say, uh, uh, some k-mers, some all k-mers, but we only pick the one that has the minimum hash value, 
right? So then this basically we have a window of k-mers. And then we from this window of k-mers, we, we pick the one with the minimum hash value. So this is like a subsampling technique. And this is there is a basic theory behind it, uh, meaning if two documents or if two sequences are similar enough, and if you basically pick the right values for k and w, they actually share this minimizer. So in a sense that if you pick the right parameters, you're not going to be losing, almost losing no information, and still you're going to be reducing your storage requirements a lot because you're sampling data here. So I, again, yeah, the, the benefit is basically reduced storage requirement, but also lamp scientists reduce sensitivity. So coming back to your question, should we basically require exact matches, right? But can we somehow also enable approximate matches of the seeds? And this is also, uh, this is the question that I also was thinking like uh, two years ago. And basically what we thought is that uh, when these two cameras are not matching, let's say their keys are also not going to be matched then we're not going to be finding this match in the hash table. But the question is, can we somehow generate the hash value, same hash value? from highly similar, but not necessarily exact k-mers. So it turns out the answer was yes. So we were able to uh, 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 basically uh, achieve this. And this basically leads us to also increased sensitivity and performance. So if you're interested in this, you can take a look at this paper and read more on how to uh, achieve this. But basically these indexing strategies, like the seeding strategies have lots of basic trade-offs. They are determining basically uh, uh, the basically the speed that we're constructing this index and also the index size. And this is basically the comparison between these indexing techniques. But the second step basically right after that is to use that index. Let's say is to use that hash table. And how do we do it? We again use the same seed selection criteria from reads. We extract again some subsequences from seeds, from reads, and then we use them to query the hash table that we constructed from a, uh, from a reference genome. And if basically there's a match between the read and the reference genome, it will basically tell us, it will give us the candidate regions in the reference genome. So remember the naive approach that we were taking initially, we were look, literally looking at the entire reference genome to figure out where this read can be coming from. But with this approach, we can quickly basically filter out the, the regions that this read may not belong to, and then focus on the regions where we have this exact matches or approximate matches of seeds, and then do the more costly operations. Uh, basically, yeah, this is uh, what's enabling us. And the costly operation is basically doing the approximate string matching, meaning now we want to identify uh, how many edits that we can do between a pair of sequences so that these two sequences are going to be identical, right? And these, uh, this is. Uh, 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 dynamic. Uh, this is done by dynamic uh, programming approach, and basically the edits are either substitutions, insertions, or deletions. Uh, so, for example, this is one example of a pair of uh, sequences. Maybe this is coming from the reference genome, and this is coming from the read. And we have two sequences, and in order to make these sequences identical to each other. Uh, uh, we may need to do seven edit operations. So the minimum edit operations that we uh, that we can do determines the edit distance between a pair of sequences. And fi figuring this out is very important so that we can tell whether this read may really belong to that particular uh, region in the, in the reference genome or not. But it's extremely basically costly to do so. In fact, this is actually uh, is taking almost uh, the, the, the uh, most of the time uh, that we're spending in, in these read mapping tools to figure out to, to uh, perform that DP computation. This is there are basically challenges in read mapping uh, for many reasons. We mean, we need to find basically many mapping uh, regions for read. Uh, there are basically some variations. This means that we need to perform approximate string matching, uh, and also we need to do this extremely fast because such an analysis is very important uh, to get the answers uh, extremely fast. And this is this type of uh, uh, computation is costly because of many reasons. This is a quadratic time dynamic uh, uh, programming algorithm. Of course, you're filling a DP table, but there are also uh, some uh, dependencies that's basically limiting some parallelism that we can do in this type of computation. There are some data dependencies, right? That limits the, uh, the, the, the computation parallelism 
over here. And the almost the entire matrix need to be filled so that we can provide the answer accurately. So there is this nice paper that's basically uh, 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 proving the computational cost of approximate string matching. And this paper is basically giving you the story of the read mapping since 1980s, uh, like the algorithms that uh, has been improved since then. Uh, basically, uh, the other question is like, what happens if we don't have any reference genome? We loosely answer that. Uh, what we do, we find the overlaps. And from this overlaps, we construct some graphs. And then this graph turns out to be uh, perhaps it can be basically converted to a genome again uh, by figuring out the consensus. So other question is uh, basically, why do we rely on a single reference genome? So we have been talking about a single reference genome so far. There is a question on YouTube. Sure. And it is why hash table and not the hash map. I think it refers to like the hashing is wrong. So I guess, uh, so the question is, so I guess the, in a sense, they are sort of similar, right? So it's essentially perhaps how you implement the data structure. So if you implement it in a hash map, let's say if it becomes a dictionary of maps, you could also implement it that way. Uh, I don't see a fundamental basically reason not to. Maybe uh, if it needs to be clarified, uh, that, that person can clarify the question even further. I'll try to answer it better if that's the case. <clears throat> so the question is basically, why do we rely on a single reference genome, right? So again, remember, we have the reference genome. We've been using a single reference genome so far. This is almost 3 billion characters. And genome is important because it determines many things, such as eye color, shape of face, and allergies, et cetera. I mean, this is what we're getting, right? These are, these are the reads. And there are many reads uh, with many length. And the origins are unknown, right? And the idea is we basically want to recover their order, right? By looking at this particular reference genome, right? So we look at these reads, and then if they match to that particular position, we can map them nicely. Uh, essentially, but this in reality, the genome that we're analyzing is not going to be exactly the same as the reference genome, right? So that's, there will be some parts that are different of course, that are different than the reference genome that we're looking at. So these are maybe variants or the sequencing errors, right? So this means that if your approximate string matching is, let's say, have a good threshold, some of these variants, vari variances will be detected, right? And it will be mapped to that single reference genome. But perhaps some variances are even, let's say, more complex such that your approximate string matching cannot even detect those. So this means that those reads won't end up getting mapped to the reference genome just because basically we're using a single reference genome. So this is known as the re reference bias. Uh, so one solution to, to yeah, go ahead. Are some like, parts controlled to be a reference to a specific region? Like, uh, there are, so there are several reasons uh, uh, why a read may not be mapped to. Uh, one, uh, so if it is too short, uh, I guess it can still be mapped as long as, let's say, we can uh, uh, identify this, the, the candidate regions in the reference genome. But if it is short, then you're reducing the chances of getting, let's say, seed matches or these camera matches between a read and the reference genome, right? Now, maybe you're going to get only one instead of like having many of those with a longer read. So this will reduce your confidence. Uh, but this, uh, why it may not be mapped to is mainly also be because of the, the difference, the huge difference that you may have between a read and the reference genome. And this difference can be caused by the sequencing error. This is, there is nothing to do with that. We cannot avoid it. But maybe this is also because of the variations that you're carrying, right? So. A reference genome is a collection of a few individuals, which is not necessarily representing you in, in the perfect way. And then if you end up having, let's say, huge variants that your approximate string matching algorithm cannot take care of, then this read may be considered as not mapped because it is too distant from, from, from your read, from your genome uh, to, the, to the reference genome. So that distance, basically, the question is that, is that distance coming from the mutation 
that you have or the sequencing error. If it is coming from the mutation, and if you end up not mapping it, you're losing an important information there, basically. Is it clear or? OK, perfect. So this is reference bias. And one basic solution to it is, OK, then let's generate multiple of these reference genomes and map our read to each of these, right? Not just one, but each of these. But then this is not really a scalable solution. You're just increasing the runtime and maybe space requirement by n times. And if you can pay for it, yes, nice. You can go ahead and then do it. Uh, but the other idea is essentially, yes, so the, a genome will differ at certain positions, but in many regions, the, the, the genomes will also share uh, the common information, right? So this means that we can perhaps even construct graphs uh, to build the reference genomes. For example, maybe these parts are, let's say, uh, uh, common in, in a particular population, but they only differ maybe from these position, positions, right? So then just encoding these differences in the, in the population using a graph structure enables you also to do some scalable uh, read mapping uh, so that you can map your read to, let's say, many population rather than a single reference genome. Uh, so to do that, the genome graphs are used to, to encode the differences. Uh, I guess the, maybe the next question is, uh, so we've been building these read mapping algorithms considering the limitation of the sequencing technologies. And the question is, uh, changes in the sequencing technologies can it render basically some read mapping algorithms irrelevant? Uh, maybe perhaps yes, but there are still some use cases that will need read mapping such as, let's say, uh, 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 metagenomics or population scale analysis, such that like we're definitely going to have variations because of the mutations, not uh, sequencing error. Uh, <laughs> right, so this brings me perhaps the last part of the lecture today, the essential algorithm, algorithmic and the hardware acceleration uh, uh, that we've been doing uh, nowadays. Uh, so basically, uh, today there is there is a significant there are significant barriers to achieve intelligent uh, analysis, and one uh, one main reason for that barrier is basically the performance gap between the data generation and the data processing. So to perform genome analysis, we start from sequencing, do read mapping, and then identify the mutations. Let's say to figure out uh, to make some let's say scientific discoveries. But we're really bottleneck in read mapping step here. So this is extremely costly to perform. Uh, and to put, to put some perspective, these are basically the throughputs of every step. And you can see the throughput of, of a, a sequencing machine over there for Illumina is around uh, 70 gig, uh, gigabases per hour. But read mapping is extremely slow. It's 0.2 gigabases per hour. So you can literally see the troop, uh, the bottleneck that we're having in, the, in these steps here. So this is because, as I said, because of the, the machines, how basically incapable these machines to analyze this such a, a large amount of data, right, in, in a very fast way, because of the data movements that, that are going on between these steps. Uh, the, exactly, so this, as I said, this is due to the expensive data movements because the sequencing machine uh, starts from the machine itself. It moves from, let's say, to the SSDs, then to the main memory, to the to the to, to the processor, back and forth. There's lots of data moment causing the causing the bottleneck, right? Uh, and essentially, what's what the, the problem here is that the data analysis is really performed far away from the data. It's performed far away from the sequencing machine, and. Uh, of course, like we're neglecting, neglecting, neglecting a lot of metadata. For example, in most cases, we're not really using the raw signal data or raw data that we're generating. Rather, we're actually sort of compressing that data to the ATGCs. But maybe there is lots of information over that that we're losing. And we're losing that just because of our incapabilities to analyze that data in a very fast way. Uh, and basically, many other reasons and like many other basic issues in, in other steps. So in basic in co computing system, maybe you, you've heard of this uh, 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 famous saying from Richard Feynman, is there is a, a plenty of room uh, at the bottom, right? So you need to, of course, uh, consider the physics of the computation to, to perhaps achieve uh, 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 or figure out 
the, the important, uh, say, opportunities over there at the bottom. But there is also a lot of room at the top as well, let's say in the algorithmic level or in the, in the, in the device level. So I guess this puts a really good perspective. Let's say this is a, a computation that we want to do. This is a simple matrix computation. But the speed that we can do such a computation differs significantly, depending on how you're doing this computation. So this is basically telling us we should really figure out how to process the data such that we're not going to be really bottleneck by how we're processing it, right? Uh, so this is also similar in the case of uh, genome analysis. So then this means that we need intelligent algorithms and intelligent architectures that handle the data well. And actually, we've been looking at this over the years. We've been uh, uh, co-designing hardware and software together across, a, a, like let's say, many steps in genome analysis. And this is basically just uh, an example of our works. And I, I'll just quickly cover some of these works quickly right now. Uh, I guess. One, uh, one of the bottlenecks in genome analysis today is the, the alignment algorithm or the approximate, approximate string measuring algorithm is extremely expensive. So then the question is, so it is expensive because we are performing this a lot of times unnecessarily, meaning we're performing approximate string matching for the sequence pairs, read and reference genome that are similar enough, right? So it's giving us some correct answers, right? But we're also performing approximate string matching for the sequence pairs that are going to end up not aligning, right? So the goal is to basically to figure out these, uh, that the, the similarity of these uh, uh, sequence pairs quickly so that we can avoid doing the costly uh, 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 alignment uh, computation. So this is basically a, a sort of visualizing what I just said. There are similar strings and also the similar strings but we're performing alignment for both of these. So the goal is to avoid performing approximate string matching for dissimilar strings, let's say, in some way. And to do that, we design some filtering algorithms. This means that, so when you query the index and then get the seed positions, like the exact matching positions, let's say, between the read and the reference genome, the idea is, okay, let's not do the read alignment right after it. So let's do some more lightweight operations in between, meaning filtering, so that we are really sure that these, this particular read can really be similar uh, at that position in the reference genome. So in a sense, it's really worth doing read alignment uh, over there. So this is basically the high level idea uh, the, uh, to filter out the ones that are dissimilar, let's say. Uh, uh, and Basically, by doing so, we'll preserve the all correct mappings. And of course, so this is an additional step here, right? So the, then the idea is that since this is an additional step, the combination of these three steps should be still faster than performing these two steps. And this can only be done if you, if you could do it quickly. And we have this paper uh, called uh, Gatekeeper. This is one of the earlier works that performs uh, uh, this uh, type of filtering using some idea known as uh, shifted timing distance. But so the, basically the idea here is that to visualize it nicely, uh, it basically quickly performs some Hamming distance calculations here. So uh, consider, the, consider these two, uh, uh, a, a pair of sequences. So these are basically exactly matching right now, right? So meaning uh, the Hamming distance between them is basically zero. In a sense, there are eight matches and zero uh, mismatches. So what happens, there is a single deletion over here. So the ide ideally, we have a single edit operation to make these sequences identical to each other, right? Which is, there's an, insert, there's an insertion here, just a single operation, and then the rest should match. But when there's a deletion, and if you do having distance, what you're going to end up getting is there will be mismatches over there. So it's basically uh, uh, overestimating the number of mismatches over here if you just simply do a Hamming distance. So we need to do something clever here. So the idea is basically, uh, so if you basically shift this entire sequence uh, by one character, right? And if you do your, let's say, uh, uh, Hamming distance operations, what you're going to observe is that, uh, so this may be corresponding to the to the sequence that you would get 
when you do when you have a one let's say deletion and this is the version with with no deletion or insertion at all and if you do xors at these positions so what you're going to end up getting is basically a bunch of zeros and ones but this is essentially what what this is telling us if you get zeros in one of these cubicles here then this means that these characters are matching each other and if you let's say have zeros in the other version of it, then this means that maybe there is, a, if you have a series of zeros here, then this means that maybe there's an insertion somewhere here because once we shifted every character by, uh, by one character right, we started getting out of matches again. So this is giving us some hint, maybe there's an insertion over here. So the idea is when you essentially shift these right and left many times and then uh, do some end operations, uh, the idea is that you, you may end up getting let's say, uh, zeros in many places, which may signal matches with a, maybe a, a few edit distance. And if you end up getting still one at a particular position, maybe this is re really an edit distance that needs to be taken. And such an operation basically is not using a DP calculation, but this is still telling us some idea, basically how uh, 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 sequences can be similar to each other. And this is basically how it is done in real time, uh, in, in, in the real case. I assume this is your query and the reference genome. And what we generate is basically, uh, we generate masks or Hamming masks for let's say uh, one insertion, two insertion or three insertion, meaning we shift the uh, read by one character, two character and three, three character, and then perform this uh, exit operation for each shifting and do, do this by moving them towards left as well to simulate the deletion behavior or insertion behavior. And by doing so, uh, essentially gather all of these, uh, uh, perform the exit operations. And then what you're going to end up getting is basically, uh, uh, basically the series of zeros by, for example, using uh, only uh, uh, no insertion and no uh, uh, insertion mask and one deletion mask. So then this is telling me that maybe there is a, only a one deletion over here because now I'm getting a, a series of uh, uh, zeros uh, significantly. Uh, so basically this is the idea and this is basically telling me, so this is not telling me the approximate, so this is not uh, solving the approximate string matching, but this is telling us extremely quickly uh, whether the, the pair of sequences are uh, similar to each other or not. And this is basically can nicely be uh, implemented in, let's say, uh, in, in architectures that can be paralyzed nicely, and you can essentially use the, utilize GPUs or APGAs to solve this problem, uh, because now you don't have the dependency problem that you would have with the approximate string matching. And this way you can basically achieve uh, significant speed ups uh, uh, by filtering the dissimilar uh, uh, sequences extremely quickly. So this is basically the idea behind Gatekeeper. This is known as sh shifted timing distance. So if you're interested in this uh, nature of operation uh, that, that Gatekeeper is doing, we can read this paper. And this is also how uh, the Gatekeeper is basically describing how this is implemented uh, to uh, accelerate to, for pre-alignment uh, filtering purposes. So other questions, can we do better? Uh, so this is another work, this is a follow-up work from Gatekeeper known as Sneaky Snake. So the key observation in Sneaky Snake and uh, uh, maybe mainly in other pre-alignment type of works is that, so this is, uh, this is an, basically a an representation of how, uh, uh, let's say a pair of sequences uh, 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 may be similar to each other when you fill the dynamic uh, programming table. So this uh, diagonal, if there's basically a, a, a color over here uh, on the diagonal, this is basically signaling matches over there. And if basically there's a gap over here, then maybe there are some insertions and deletions over here. But basically the idea is that when two sequences are similar to each other, so we're going to basically see lots of uh, uh, matches in the diagonal part uh, of the, of, of, of between a pair of sequences. So, but then the question is, so then how can we basically find the shortest path from here to here by, uh, by following other paths in the, in the gap over there? Uh, uh, so essentially this is the key idea in Sneaky Snake. And what Sneaky Snake is doing is, is basically reducing the problem to the single net routing problem in the VLSI chips. 
So this is also similar to perhaps uh, filling the dynamic uh, programming table. So what uh, uh, maybe like one of the ways of doing single net routing is like when you give a signal from here and let's say, what are the ways that you can take in the chip to get the signal out, let's say from one of these uh, regions. And, but there are going to be obstacles in your, in your chip, meaning like how can you basically take a minimum number of obstacles so that you can give this signal over here and then take, take the output from over there. And this is basically one way of routing the signal, uh, right? And this is also very similar uh, to somehow similar to uh, 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 identifying uh, the similarities between a pair of signals. So this is basically what Sneaky Snake is exploiting. It's similar, maybe in a sense, similar to Gatekeeper. Uh, it's generating the uh, uh, diagonals and anti-diagonals uh, um, uh, between a pair of sequences. So the, the ones are telling you uh, there's a match uh, when you, for example, shift the entire sequence uh, one time right, and the second upper diagonal is telling you there's a match when you shift it two times right, and so on. But essentially what you do is that you consider it as basically uh, the, the, the free spaces and blocked spaces or obstacles in your chip. So what you do is that you start from the, you start your snake from the entrance and then you start moving from any basically available space and you do this in an extremely parallel way. So basically if there's a free space, you are free to go from that space, right? But as you do this operation, when you reach an obstacle, you just reduce uh, one from, let's say from your life, uh, the, your remaining life. And then you do this every time you reach an obstacle and then you again broadcast uh, uh, your, the ways that you can go and then you can do this and so on. And then maybe try to reach the exit uh, without basically uh, reaching the threshold uh, of your lifespan. So if you can do this, then this can tell us in a very parallel and quick way that maybe these sequences are uh, similar to each other because we were able to enter from here and exit here by only, uh, by only let's say, uh, uh, reaching to a few obstacles, meaning maybe there are only a few uh, mismatches or edits between a pair of sequences. Uh, so this such an idea can actually be implemented in FPGAs extremely efficiently with a very low area overhead. And this is basically, uh, since this is basically providing also lots of parallelism and the area speed ups, uh, area savings, uh, this is much faster than the earlier works uh, such as Gatekeeper. Uh, so uh, I also mentioned the essential the problem, uh, the the problem related to the data moment, right? So we're also doing lots of work uh, on processing the data in memory or near memory. And if you want to learn about these, of course, you can uh, watch these videos. So you can find these links in, in the slides, of course. And uh, this is also nice work how we can actually exploit uh, 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 near memory computation to perform pre-alignment, namely uh, Sneaky Snake. In this particular case, uh, 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 so we map essentially the, the, the uh, Sneaky Snake problem uh, uh, to, to perform that in, in near memory so that we can also reduce the data moment over there. And doing so, we can also improve its energy efficiency and performance significantly just because uh, we can reduce the data moment overhead. And uh, this is all explained in, in basically Sneaky Snake and also the previous paper that I just uh, showed you. Uh, there is another work uh, that is also exploiting the uh, 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 the near memory processing idea, uh, or let's say it's using 3D stacked uh, DRAMs. So this is a uh, green filter. And in, uh, in green filter, what we're essentially doing is um, basically, so remember the seeds that we're storing, uh, that we're extracting from reference genome and then storing in the hash table. So the idea is we can uh, do the queries in extremely parallel way. So then the question is then how? Uh, in green filter, we're exploiting the structure of the 3D stack DRAM. So what this means is that in the bottom layer, you have your logic layer, right? So you have your custom uh, logic, let's say. In the upper levels, you have the DRAM layers. So if, if basically it's a DRAM, maybe you're already familiar with the, with the structure of the DRAM. You have basically a bunch of uh, 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 bangs and subarrays and so on. But essentially what we, what we end up getting in each bank is like there's a single row buffer and also the 
the rows over here. So the question is, like, how can we utilize this uh, particular uh, architecture to solve our problem? Uh, so the idea is essentially to uh, store the seeds somehow in these uh, 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 in these banks or in these let's say rows, uh, so that we can perform the queries to the hash table in a massively parallel way. Uh, and basically, this is sort of the details how we uh, uh, do this uh, in Green Filter. So what we're doing is that assume that this is the reference genome. We're chunking this into bins, right? And for each bin, we're creating a bit vector. So the, this bit vector is, is basically just including a bunch of zeros and ones. And basically, this is telling us if there is a zero, it's basically telling us whether that particular camera exists in that particular bin or not. So this is, this is the only thing that's telling us. So it's not really giving us the position information, but the position information is somehow inherently uh, basically contained with the bin because we know where the bins are. So, so basically, these are the bit vectors that we're constructing for, for every uh, uh, bin in the reference genome. So that basically, then the idea is uh, to construct these bit vectors for every bin in the reference genome and then store them in the, in the banks of, of the 3D stack uh, DRAM that I just showed you. Essentially, how we're using these bit vectors is as follows. So we have a, assume that we have a read. What we do is that we extract these k-mers again, and then we query the bin, essentially, with these bit vectors. So basically, if that k exists in that bit vector, then we're going to return 1. And if it doesn't exist, it will, we're going to return 0. But what we end up doing is that we do the, the summation. We basically sum ones and zeros. And, then, and if we have enough ones, then this means that we have basically enough matching k between a read and the bin that we're checking. So then the question is, which bin that we're going to uh, 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 check, right? So this is, this is basically done in a massively parallel way. We can simply query uh, all the bit vectors in parallel using the 3D stack, 3D, 3D stack uh, DRAM structure that I just showed you, and then do the computation, uh, the summation, the threshold checking computation in the logic layers uh, down there. Uh, so basically, this is including very simple operations, such as like a summation, uh, comparison against bit vectors. This is highly parallel. Uh, but essentially, the naive implementation of green filter in, in the CPUs is basically memory bound. So that's why we're essentially uh, 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 incorporating this in a 3D stack uh, DRAM. Here in the banks, we have the bit vectors. When we create a bit vector, the result goes down to the logic layer. We do the computation in the logic layer so that we're not really bounded by the data moment uh, overhead. Uh, so this is actually showing us how, how important it is to basically uh, co-design hardware and software together so that we can solve the bottlenecks. So if you're interested in this, you can uh, learn more about Green Filter by watching uh, Jeremy's uh, uh, video uh, over here. So we also uh, work on uh, essentially how we accelerate, let's say, the approximate string matching. So we don't only design, let's say, uh, co-design hardware and software for pre-alignment purposes, but we also accelerate the approximate string matching algorithm itself. And this is uh, the, the GNASM framework. Uh, so basically, the, the goal is to uh, accelerate the approximate string matching for many use cases. And the idea is uh, uh, basically exploit uh, and a highly parallel algorithm that is used for approximate string matching, um, the, which is also containing a, a, a large number of, let's say, bitwise computations. So such a bitwise computation can maybe, let's say, not so valuable for a general purpose machine, but when you consider, let's say, uh, specialized uh, 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 custom, let's say, hardware designs that you can do with an FPGA or with an ASIC design, then this gets interesting because it can be extremely efficient to design these uh, uh, in, the, in, in such uh, specialized uh, uh, devices. So uh, what we show is that uh, genism can actually be used in many steps in genome analysis. So it can be used for read alignment. It can be used for pre-alignment purposes. And it can also be used for edit distance calculation for any use case. And basically, by co-designing the, the highly parallel and, 
and also highly parallel algorithm that also contains bitwise operations uh, with a special, let's say, hardware, uh, we're showing that this can actually achieve uh, uh, extremely uh, significant speed ups and also energy efficiencies. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on genism, but if you're interested in this, you can check this uh, talk. So the Scrooge is a follow-up work on genism. This means that we don't stop, uh, like when we basically uh, publish a paper, we still look at the ways that we can improve it. And Scrooge is a good example of it. So it's basically improving its, let's say, algorithm even further to achieve uh, improvements basically on, on its CPU implementation and also in uh, implementation on other architectures. Uh, so you can basically read this paper or watch the talk uh, if you are basically interested in learning this. And remember I mentioned to you the graph, uh, the reference genomes that can be uh, uh, built using graphs. So this is basically uh, what we've uh, done in, in the Segram work. What we do is that what we observe essentially is uh, mapping the reads to graphs also contains lots of uh, data moment overheads, many, let's say, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, let's say local or random accesses uh, to memory, which could actually be exploited uh, using a specialized hardware design. Um, so essentially what we do is that we accelerate uh, the sequence to graph mapping uh, algorithm. Uh, this contains basically uh, uh, several steps in Segram. Uh, it even includes the step uh, to accelerate the seeding so that we can quickly extract the seed. And so, if we can, so the idea here is that if we can do this on an accelerator and not on host, for example, in CPU, then this means that we're also reducing the data movement uh, uh, in, in, the, in the entire system as well. So it's important also to accelerate the entire application so that you can uh, reduce the demo, data movement everywhere. So this basically leads to essentially, again, significant speed ups uh, uh, and also energy improvements uh, uh, compared to the state of the art work. Again, there's a talk about this on paper. If you're interested in this, you can uh, 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 essentially read. So this is basically, I guess, another example of how uh, perhaps costly a data moment can be. So you, in genome sequence analysis, what happens is that we have this storage system that may be storing the genomic data. So what happens is that it goes through the, the entire stack of the architecture down to the computation, for example, CPU to be processed. And we know that this is costly, right? And there's also data moment overhead because it moves from the storage system down to the, the, down to the CPU, let's say. And people are designing, of course, heuristics, let's say, to reduce the data moment uh, up to a point, meaning they sample the data and we're also designing accelerators and so on, some filters to also accelerate the computation. So this means that perhaps the computation overhead is now minimized, but this doesn't mean that the data moment still happens from the storage system down to the CPU. So there's still a data moment that, that's bottlenecking the entire system. So then the question is, how can we actually, the key idea is like, how can we reduce the amount of data that needs to, that needs to move from the storage system down to the CPU so that we can minimize this uh, uh, data moment overhead. So we basically identify uh, uh, such a uh, uh, filtering, let's say, can be done by identifying if the reads are exactly matching between a read and the reference genome, it doesn't have to move to the CPU because we already know that it's aligning because it's exactly matching, or maybe it is too similar, too dissimilar, uh, to the reference genome. So if you can also somehow identify this in the storage system quickly, then this means that we don't have to send this to the CPU uh, and then reduce the, the, to the data moment overhead. So this is basically how we are uh, exploiting uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, uh, how we're basically trying to reduce the data moment in the storage systems. And um, so there are of course like uh, several challenges and one challenge is that what we are trying to do is that we are trying to essentially build some uh, logic units in the in the storage system, so that we can use that logic unit without moving the data too much to the CPU. But in reality, we have limited hardware resources that we can build, and in, in the, for example, in the SSD. And by uh, uh, basically uh, keeping these challenges in mind, 
uh, we propose we propose a, like some gemstone enabled storage system that reduces both computational overhead and the data movement overhead, so that we can provide significant uh, uh, improvements in the in the in the uh, uh, genome analysis. So I'm almost uh, done. So we have five minutes uh, until the end of the lecture. Maybe I'll need five more minutes after that if uh, this is okay uh, with you uh, also. So all but feel free uh, to leave basically after uh, 6 uh, p.m. So this is uh, another work. This is basically uh, uh, essentially looking at the nanopore sequencing, right? So this is basically general pipeline, how we do genome analysis as we covered. We co uh, generate raw signal data. We translate it to the, the reads, let's say, doing some uh, uh, heavy computations and then do like, uh, many other computations. So I'm reshowing these because I want to highlight the fact that what we do is that we generate the data fully so that we can also do these computations uh, 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 step by step. But the idea is that should we actually generate the data fully and then so that we can uh, uh, generate our uh, answers. So this is problematic because the raw signals, the electrical signals are generate, we're generating are moving to base calling, but we end up getting smaller data. This moves to, let's say, uh, to further step in the genome analysis. So what we end up getting is uh, the data much smaller than what we started with. But the, the key here is that there's a large data movement here across the steps, and the question is, can we avoid this? Uh, so this is basically another way of showing this. So we start with 100% of data, but we, we end up only having 10% of it. Uh, uh, basically here, there's a large data movement and some of these, uh, some of this data that moves is actually unnecessary because it won't be useful for our downstream analysis down the road. So the key idea in GEMPIP is that, can we actually not generate the data fully, but only generate the chunk of it and then analyze that chunk quickly in the downstream analysis without generating the full data and then try to figure out whether we need to keep sequencing or keep generating the next chunk of the of that data uh, because maybe that chunk or that read is going to be useful for us. And if we can identify from that particular chunk that we're uh, extracting, we can if we can identify that that read is going to be useless for us, then this means that we can stop our analysis at that point, meaning we don't have to generate the rest of the data for that particular read, saving a lot of unnecessary data movement and also uh, 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 compute cycles, let's say. So this is basically how it is done. Let's say only for a small chunk, we're translating that small chunk to the basis and then doing the rest of analysis and so on. And if we can answer basically whether uh, uh, further chunks should be, let's say, translated and analyzed, we keep doing it or, or not basically based on the chunks that we generated so far. So this is also showing us some, uh, the opportunity that we have by reducing the data movement. So in basically another, uh, the contribution that we're making in GEMPIP is basically we're designing this in a near uh, memory, actually in memory accelerators so that we can uh, essentially uh, uh, combine two steps together very closely, namely the base calling step which translates the signals to the basis and the read mapping step. So when these are co very close to each other, then this means that the data movement between them is also minimized. Uh, so we're also taking this into consideration. And by reducing this data movement, uh, so essentially what we can achieve is, is a significant speed up. But if we also even consider the ideal cases, for example, if we assume there is no even data movement overhead at all uh, in the system, uh, this is showing the opportunities uh, that we can achieve, meaning we can achieve even uh, huge speed ups. Uh, so this is again, one work that is uh, uh, essentially accelerating sneaky snake. We also have other, uh, uh, accelerating other applications uh, in or near memory. Uh, this is also another work that uh, uses a real processing in memory device to implement uh, uh, the approximate stick matching algorithm. So if you're interested in how the real processing in memory devices are used with this type of uh, problems. You can take a look at this paper. Uh, maybe the last question is, what else can we do? So I sort of hinted this in the beginning of the lecture that there, there are now like newer opportunities because of the newer genomics, uh, genome sequencing technology is being developed. And this is basically one example, uh, which is raw hash. 
So in Noah Hash, what we're doing is that uh, this is basically one example uh, of uh, of how real-time analysis work. So the, as the as the electrical signals are generated, so these are generated in real time. So what we can do is that we can analyze this data also in real time while they are being generated. The challenge is that we need to match the throughput of the data generation, which is uh, basically challenging to do so uh, because we've been. We, we kept saying towards the lecture, the data speed is huge that the, the, that the computation perhaps cannot even match. And what we can do is that based on this analysis, we can make some real-time decisions. And the benefits of these real-time analysis is essentially twofold. One is you can reduce the uh, anal uh, latency of genome analysis because in the regular case, you have sequencing and then the analysis time. But then maybe you can bring the sequencing and analysis together so that you can reduce the latency. And also, instead of completely uh, sequencing the entire read, you can only partially sequence the read. And this means that you can actually save uh, uh, from sequencing time and cost per read if you can make this decision. So there are some challenges to achieve this. For example, you need to match the throughput of the data generation speed. We want to basically stop sequencing it quickly so that we save from sequencing time and cost. And of course, we want to do accurate analysis. Uh, and, and also we want to do this efficiently. And basically one way of doing it is to basically uh, compute some distance between electrical signal to achieve that type of analysis. But rather what we do is uh, we do some fast matching between signals by uh, uh, generating hash values from signals and matching these hash values using the hash table idea that I described uh, earlier. So I'm going to skip these slides a uh, little quickly so these are a little bit more details about raw hash, but what, what we do here is that these signals are essentially corresponding to the k-mers, right? So the challenge is that is to figure out which signal is corresponding to which k-mer so that we can somehow uh, generate a hash release from them. So we, to achieve this, we do this some, we do some quantization technique and also uh, 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 we're essentially packing the, the quantized values together so that we can generate hash values so that the signals can be matched to each other quickly. And this is then this becomes similar to the regular uh, read mapping step uh, where the hash values are matched. And every time a signal generated, we continues to make the decision whether we should stop sequencing or not based on the analysis that we've done so far. So this is basically enabling us the real time analysis. Uh, basically, this is raw hash. If you are interested in this, you can uh, read the paper. So this is the follow-up work from raw hash. Uh, what we also do is we also align these signals using some sort of approximate string matching, let's say, but using a dynamic time warping to make even more accurate calculations. So this is uh, explained in the raw align work. And this is also target call. This is basically aiming how to basically reduce the workload of base calling, which is the translating the signals to bases by also figuring, figuring out whether uh, a read is going to be useful or not quickly. So then I guess this brings me to literally the end of the, almost end of the lecture. Uh, basically the adoption of the hardware accelerators in genome analysis is very important. And basically this, is, this has been a dream, let's say, uh, for a very long time uh, in, 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 in the software research group. So the idea was that is it can we build an embedded device that can perform comprehensive genome analysis in real time, right? So this is what we covered. And, this, and we're seeing that things are really happening in, in the industry today. For example, the, one of the sequencing technologies, Illumina, is now building FPGA uh, uh, machines along with their sequencers to make the genome analysis uh, quick. And also there are now startups that are exploiting these architectures uh, to uh, perform uh, real-time genome analysis, and they are being actually bought up by these industrial leaders such as Emedia. And even Emedia now started uh, supporting, let's say, uh, these common operations that we do in genome analysis, such as now we can even do dynamic programming, uh, let's say, uh, in the in the in the GPU architectures that the Emedia. Uh, is now, uh, uh, let's say, building in the recent devices. So this is making basic dynamic, dynamic, time, uh, dynamic pro programming operations faster. And right now we're also seeing collaborations between companies such as BioNano and Nmedia is now trying to accelerate 
the, the, the genome analysis steps as well. So basically there's a bright future for intelligent genome analysis because of the synergy right now going in the industry as well. And, the, and but still computing is still bottlenecked by the data moment. And uh, there are essentially uh, uh, challenges to, uh, to solve these problems uh, when designing, co-designing and hardware and, and, and uh, uh, hardware and software together. Uh, so I'm going to skip these relatively quickly, uh, but I guess the question is, did we uh, achieve our goal, right, to perform fast genome analysis within mere seconds? I would say we're getting there, but we're not there yet. Things are improving. So I guess we should keep working on co-designing and designing like intelligent architectures and algorithms so that we can accelerate the steps because now we're seeing also a new technologies. This is Cerebra's basically wafer scale engine. This is like a huge ML accelerator, let's say, uh, with trillions of transistors uh, to perform the ML operations really fast. And this is basically the newer version of the Cerebra's. So the question is, how can we utilize these new architectures to solve really important problems? So this is basically the, the, the Dragon, uh, uh, the FPGA that I mentioned in the Illumina, and this is uh, the, the NVIDIA machine that I showed you before. And we're actually a part of this uh, effort. This is basically a EU funded uh, project uh, called Biopim. And our goal is essentially to uh, build a processing in memory, uh, uh, let's say system that can uh, analyze the genome uh, extremely quickly, starting from the sequencing machine up until, up until the end, end step of, of, of the genome analysis. And there are now real uh, processing in memory devices that you can literally buy, perhaps buy, I guess, uh, and, and start implementing your uh, uh, problem to these devices so that you can solve your problem uh, relatively quickly. Uh, so to conclude, I guess, uh, system design, let's say for bioinformatics is a critical problem. We should think of the entire stack of the, of the architecture. And basically this lecture is about essentially accelerating a key step in bioinformatics, uh, namely genome sequence analysis, many steps in genome analysis, but especially we focused on the techniques for read mapping. And we covered like various recent ideas to accelerate genome analysis, but many future opportunities exist uh, to, to make this even further. Uh, so if you're interested in this, these are really good readings. These are really good books to learn about the algorithms, useful algorithms uh, to accelerate the genome analysis. These are a few overview of readings that you can uh, uh, check. This is a recent one. Uh, this is also a, like how, how we can use uh, real PIM. And this is, this is a workshop that we organized at a, a, a basically an international conference this year. Uh, that we covered basically these hardware software uh, uh, efforts uh, for genome analysis. And we've been giving also lots of talks uh, on this uh, direction. So this is a talk uh, at, for example, uh, at Berkeley. This is another talk, uh, like essentially, if you're interested in learning more about these, you can, you can check these and then learn about this uh, even more. And this is another talk for real-time analysis. So we're also giving courses. We have project and seminar courses. Uh, offered for uh, mainly for uh, uh, the ITET uh, students, so you can take these, uh, and we're going to offer we're going to offer you projects, let's say, to work on, so that you can learn more about uh, basically the algorithms in in genomics. Th these are basically the other courses in PIM and SSD. Uh, basically, there are lots of materials out there uh, for you to learn about if you are interested in this uh, in this uh, area, and this is. Basically, the, we're going to be having a workshop or tutorial uh, in a few days at Micro. Uh, so, so this is going to be about real-world uh, uh, processing in memory tutorial. So you can watch this on YouTube. This is going to be live streamed. And, and this is basically the links uh, to, to check. So with that, I guess uh, I'll end the lecture uh, now. And I guess if there are any questions, I can also try to answer quickly. Are there any on YouTube or here on Zoom? Okay, then yeah, I'll check it and answer offline due to the time limit. So then thanks everyone. Thanks for your attention. Uh, I guess we'll see you next week.